Is our C++ book made by Pearson? Yeah, it's a Pearson product. Oh. Wait, I am buying as a Pearson product. <laughs> so, we already know how to use CIN because I love showing y'all things before we get to it in the chapter. CIN stands for Standard Input Object. Let you type stuff in. Now, technically speaking, it's actually std colon colon cin. But in our boilerplate, we always have using namespace std, which lets us get rid of that. If we did not include that using namespace statement, every time we use cin, we'd have to put std colon colon in front of it, which is more typing, so why not use the namespace? It requires this file, so we have to do pound sign include IO stream for it to start working. And what does it do? It lets us type stuff in, gets input from the keyboard. When we use a greater than, greater than, so it's CIN, greater than, greater than, and then the variable that you're feeding into. Now you can actually store data in more than one variable at a time if you so choose. Now I don't recommend that you do this. But if you so choose, you, you can actually read data into two variables or three or four using CIN at the same time. And I'll show you how to do it, and then I'll recommend you never do it. Oh, I need to create a new file. New file, grab the boilerplate, all that fun stuff. So I want an empty project. I think I forgot to give it a name, but I should have called it Lecture E. From the Solution Explorer, I'm going to right click and add a new source file. Lecture E. And I'm going to grab my boilerplate. Oh, yeah, I forgot to change that to. I'm going to rename it. Lecture E, or not lecture E. Alrighty. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to ask the user to enter two numbers separated by a space and hit enter. Very specific, but anyways. So, C out, less than, less than, quote, enter two numbers separated by a space and then hit enter. end quote, less than, less than, E-N-D-L, semicolon. Oh, man, I can't even see the whole thing. Yep, too long, but there we go. All righty, now we need two variables to hold those numbers, int space x comma y, semicolon, and let's do C-I-N, greater than, greater than x, greater than, greater than y, semicolon, And I can pretty much guarantee we're going to wind up commenting this stuff out because otherwise we're going to be typing in two numbers separated by space every single time we run the program. But for now, we want to see what happens. And then now let's print out the results of x and y. So C out, less than, less than, quote, x equals, or just how about an equal sign, x equals, end quote, less than, less than, le x, less than, less than, e and dl. And then C out less than, less than, quote, Y equals, end quote, less than, less than Y, less than, less than E and DL. All right, now what was the point of all this is to show you this part. I'll probably never use that again in this class, but we've got to demonstrate it at least one time. Let me run it and then I'll bring the code back on the screen. All right, enter two numbers separated by a space and hit enter. Okay, 12 and then 90. All right, and so x equals 12, y is equal to 90. The first number we typed in got stored in x because it's the first after the CIN. The second number I typed in after the space, the 90 got stored into y. So when we printed it out, x was 12 and y was 90. 
What did it do? It separated, it figured out that the first piece of data ended at the space and the second piece of data ended at the character turn. That's called tokenizing the input. Everything separated by a space or separated by a carriage return is considered one so-called token. So if I run it again and I forget to type in two numbers, if I only type in one number even though it told me to type in two, watch what happens. 12? Hmm. Broke. Not really. It's still waiting for me to enter the second number. And then x is 12 and y is 90. So it was still tokenizing it. It found the first number. It stopped reading it at the carriage return. And then it wanted a second number. And it kept waiting for us to type in a second number. So it kept just sitting there. And then finally, when we typed in another number and hit enter, it was able to read it in. This is the big reason why I don't like reading in two numbers at the same time because it's too easy to mess up and you're sitting there wondering, you know, why isn't the program doing anything? So I usually ask for one variable at a time rather than letting them type in two, three, or four. But you can. You could say enter four numbers separated by spaces. And you just use CIN, greater than, greater than, variable one, greater, greater, variable two, greater, greater, variable three, and so on. Oh, and before we comment this out, because that's what we're going to do so we don't have to type in every single number every single time, comment out the using namespace std line. And then we're going to make all the fixes required to get that to work. So comment that out and then hit Control S or Command S on your Mac. Wait, if you're on a Mac, you can... Anyways, you're going to be doing something else. Take uh, it, It's underlining everything we have to fix. STD colon colon needs to go there. Also needs to go there. STD colon colon. There's a couple more. STD colon colon. STD colon colon. I'm going to stop saying it and just do it. Once you fix them all, and you can control S to save it and run it. All right. That's what you'd have to do if you left off the using namespace std. You'll see a lot of example code on the internet that's like that. Because people who post code on the internet do not necessarily want to add using namespace std. So, but it works just fine either way. Once you do get it working, Go ahead and take that back out, right? Go ahead and add the using namespace std part again once you get it working. All right, so. For some reason, it's kind of on here. Well, we're not going to put it in front of everything. We're just going to put it in front of everything that was underlined. That's just supposed to be int like it was. Oh. oh, you got them all already. Well, I'm surprised you didn't Yeah, so fix that one. This? Yep. STD colon colon. No, no, just in front of it. Put the cursor right in front of it. Here, like this. Oh, I did not know that. And there's going to be other places where you have to do that as well. In front of those two.
All righty. As promised, I'm going to comment this stuff out so I don't have to type it in every single time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all of these lines like this. Right, I'm going to highlight those lines. And I'm going to go up to Edit, Advanced, Comment, Selection. And all it did is add those double slashes there. But if I ever wanted to uncomment them, you know, I, I could have conceivably just done that to a thousand lines of code with a couple of clicks. When I'm ready to get them back into working, I would highlight them again, choose Advanced, Uncomment Selection. And I'm going to go ahead and put this back into action so I don't have to put STD. So really all I did is I took all of our stuff and I put double slashes in front of it. <coughs> so CIN does convert data to the type that matches a variable. If it's an int, it'll convert what's typed into an int. Now if, you, if it asks for an int and you give it something else, it's going to freak out. Let me give you an example. You don't have to type this. Enter a num. And now I'm going to create a variable. And I'm going to store a number into it. And then I'm going to ask for another number. C out less than less than enter another. And then I'm going to do that again. C and greater than greater than num. Watch what happens if I type in something that's not an integer, not a whole number. Enter a number. 1.5. Enter another. Press any key to continue. Now I did not hit enter a second time. It did it all on its lonesome. You could have even proven that if I'd given the no, that, that wouldn't have been a good example. But anyways, I'm going to do that again. I'm not believing my eyes. Enter a num, 1.5. Hit enter one time. Enter another. Press any key to continue. It ended my program because I gave it incorrect formatted data. What if I type, run it, and I type in a letter rather than a number? Doesn't work. Okay, so there's limits to how well it works, but it does try to convert what they typed in into the correct data. If you want to support decimal points, 3.4, something like that, you better make your data a double rather than an int. So displaying a prompt. We always do this. The prompt is the question. How tall is the room? What is the value of x? What is the age of the patient? What is the height of the rectangle? So CIN will support going into multiple variables. I don't recommend that you do it. The order is important. The first thing they type in will go into the first variable. The second thing that they type in will go into the second variable. You don't recommend doing that? Yeah. I'll uh, remind you why. Let me uncomment this code out. Edit, advanced, uncomment. And when I run it, if I only type in one thing rather than two, it just hangs. And I could sit here and hit enter all day and it's not going to do anything. Eventually I may remember I was supposed to type in a second piece of data. But that kind of weird behavior where they've entered one piece of data and it's waiting for the next one is why I don't do it that way. Why I do not do it with two variables after the CIN. I just ask them one question, let them type it in, then I ask another question, let them type it in. Mathematical expressions. An expression is a series of data elements separated by operators. Now there may just be one data element, in which case there's not going to be any operators. Examples in our code, we could write in something like this. int x equals 3. 3 is an expression, but it's, it's so primitive, it's so simple that we don't normally think of it as an expression. x equals 3 times 4 divided by 2, semicolon. That's also an expression. 
right? It's a series of values and operators. Asterisk being the operator, division being the operator. So an expression is a series of values and operators. So if you did this, A is equal to B plus C, then B plus C is the expression. Y is equal to POW 2 to the power of 9. Well, POW 2 comma 9 is the expression. It gets evaluated so that the result can be used. POW 2 to the power of 9, whatever that is. 512, I think, gets stored into Y. B plus C gets evaluated and stored into A. When you're looking at an expression, if it's got an operator, usually there'll be two pieces of data feeding the operator. If you have B plus C, then the plus sign is the operator. B and C are the operands. The operands are the pieces of data the operator is working on. Alrighty, there were definitely things at the end of the quiz for chapter two that I meant to come back and, and revisit. Let me sneak a peek at the quiz so I can remember that. I'm seeing the conferences button, but it's not enabled in this class. Yeah, I don't know what that does. I think it lets you create conferences and stuff. At the end of the quiz, there were some things that weren't actually in the chapter. It's like stuff from actually from chapter three, like that one. All right, well, I'll just tuck that away in my brain. We're going to talk about the ternary operator again. So mathematical expression, 2 times pi times radius, that's the expression. And then the result of it is used with the assignment operator to store it there. Or well, here's an expression, 2 times L plus W, and it's not being stored in a variable, right? There's no equal sign, but it is being printed out with C out. So an expression can be a literal, like a number, a variable, like radius or a combination of them. Typically they're evaluated left to right. Right? 2 plus 2 times 2 minus 2. Now I lied when they're not that they're evaluated left to right. That's not strictly true. From a programming point of view, which of these things happens first? Yeah, Multiplication. Sure. Multiplication happens first. If you typed in this phrase into your, into your scientific calculator, 2 plus 2 times 2 minus 2, and then hit the Enter key, it would do that part first, and then it would add 2, and then it would subtract 2. So we can prove that to ourselves. Let's go here and see out less than less than 2 plus 2 times 2 minus 2, less than, less than E and DL, and it's going to equal 4. If it just went from left to right, here's what would happen. 2 plus 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, minus 2 is 6. Like if you were using a $5 calculator, you got a Dollar General or something like that, then yeah, it might do it like that. 
but a real calculator is supposed to do it so that the multiplication and division are done before addition and subtraction. So when I run it, I'm expecting to see a 4 on the screen. Yep. It's just like, and I know that we know this from math classes, if you group part of the expressions together with parentheses, that's the part that gets done first. But we don't have to group that part together because already the multiplication is happening first. Four. Yep. So let's make a comment to the effect that 2 times 2 is done first because multiplication has higher precedence, higher priority than addition and subtraction. I think it's supposed to be parentheses first as well. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's p. It would be e if we had exponents in this language, but we don't. Md for multiplication, division, and then as for addition and subtraction. So these are your parentheses. They have highest priority, higher precedence. And then you have multiplication and division, also modulus, and then addition and subtraction. And so people have come up with the uh, little mnemonic, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's how they remember P-M-D-A-S. Where'd the E go? Well, that stands for exponent, but our language doesn't have an exponent operator. Python does, Java and C++ do not. So I'm going to delete that silly phrase. But do remember, P, M, D, A, S, parentheses have highest priority. Multiplication and division have higher priority than addition and subtraction. I do not like the way C++ has it set up. Why is that? Uh, they don't have an exponent operator. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I wonder uh, if they're going to add that or not. I don't know. It's been around since 1970. So what? The language is 49 years old. Okay, the C programming language has been around that long. C++ dates from the mid-80s, but still, they haven't added it. Neither is Java. I don't get it. <laughs> All right, so these expressions, if we scroll them off so we don't see the answers, which gets done first, multiplication or addition? That part does. So 2 times 4 is 8, and then 5 plus 8 is 13. If I scrolled over there, I'd see 13. What about this one? What gets done first, division or subtraction? Division. Yeah, so 10 divided by 2 is 5, minus 3 is 2. Which happens first, that, that, or that? The multiplication, so 12 times 2 is 24. 8 plus 24 is 32, I think. Minus 4 is 28. Yep, all right. And I saw the other answers. That's 4 and that's 6. No, but let's look at it. This one is modulus. I'm going to skip modulus for a moment. And then 6 minus 3 times 2 plus 7 minus 1. How long can we make this? 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. Plus 7 minus 1. So that was equal 6. All right. It's the percent sign that's the weirdest one. That means modulus. Have I talked about modulus yet in here, or do I need to do the lecture? I know that we've done it in prior classes if you took fundamentals, but not everybody has. Percent sign means modulus. It's the modulus operator. What does that mean? It means remainder of. If I set up this math right here, Good old long division. And you have five, ooh, love that sound, and then three. Three goes in, wait, that's in the wrong place. It's been so long since I've done long division. Three goes into five how many times? Once. One, with a remainder of? Two. Two, yeah, this is the modulus part. So if we wrote five modulus, 3, it means 3 goes into 5 
one time with a remainder of two. That's what modulus means. What if we had three going into six? Uh, three goes into six how many times? Two. Two. Two times three is six. It's going to be zero. Zero, right. So six modulus two is? Nothing. Yep, zero. I wouldn't say, I would say it doesn't exist, but there's actually properties of map saying, saying it's undefined or it does not exist. So let's play, well, anyways. So zero modulus anything is zero, right? Zero modulus. One modulus three is what? Three goes into one zero times with a remainder of? Zero. Nope. If I went up there and I did my long division and I put three here and one there, the three goes into the one how many times? Zero. One time. Yep. With a remainder of one. Yep. Two modulus three. Three goes into two zero times with a remainder of? Yeah, make you do the long division with that horrible squeaky pen. All right, so <laughs> two, three. Three goes into two zero times. Oh. With a remainder of two. Yep, you got it. Crap. How about three modulus three? Well, three goes into three one time with a remainder of what? Yeah. Us. Yeah, us is zero. All right, and then so on. Four modulus three is one. Five modulus three is two. Six modulus three, back to zero, and so on. I think three modulus zero does not exist. That, that would probably be a, a, a crash. Let's find out. <laughs> Let's do that. Int, int, disaster equals three modulus zero. All right, we're just gonna crash our program here. Just for fun. Build failed. Well, why is that? Oh, it won't even crash, it just flat out won't let us do it. Shame on it. All right, so it's smart enough, the compiler is smart enough to try to avoid letting our program crash. Let's think. Nice, but we could force the issue, right? If we did int x equals 3, comma, y equals 0, and if we did int z equals x modulus y semicolon, that's definitely going to, it will compile, and it'll run. It'll generate an exception. Oh, yes, are you really? Oh, I already had that variable defined somewhere. Never mind. Wait a minute. I already had x defined somewhere else. Somewhere up here. Okay, fine. Int a equals 3, b equals 0, and c equals a modulus b. And the reason why is because if you do integer math, you can't divide by 0 and get a valid result. People say that something divided by 0 is infinity. Okay, but your computer can't do it. So when it runs, yeah, it blew up. Unhandled exception, integer division by zero. Because <laughs> modulus is just a form of, di of division. It has to do some division in order to get the remainder. If you ever get this box right here, unhandled exception, then just break it, and after you're done thinking about it, press the red stop button to stop debugging it. All right, since that broke it, I'm going to delete those two lines. I'm going to try that. <laughs> so you can use parentheses to group parts of the expression together if you need to. And an example of that is some homework that you're going to wind up doing before too long. Nah, I'm not going to even show that homework. But we know how to use parentheses. You, you've used them in prior math classes and science classes. 
2 plus 2 times 2 minus 2. We know that we would group those together first. 2 plus 2 is 4. And we would then do these. 2 minus 2 is 0. So 4 times 0 is 0. So algebraic expressions. If you look something up on the internet or in a math book, it won't show asterisks. And putting a big X next to it is considered childish in, uh, in book form. I think it's very useful. But like if we look up the formula for area of cylinder. There, look at that. Right? Not a single asterisk in sight. If we wanted to get this to work in our language, in C, or Python, or C++, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to put asterisks between everything to get all the division to work, right? 2 times pi times r times h plus 2 times pi times, and since we don't have an exponent, times r times r, or, time, or use the POW function. So that's what this slide is saying. Multiplication requires an operator. Math books will say things like LW, meaning length times width, but we got to do L times W. And also, there's no exponent operator, as we've mentioned. And so if you need to do S squared, you do POW S comma 2. I have a question. Yes, sir. OK, so after running the, um, the, undefined, the undefined variables, uh, my program broke, so how do I fix it? Good question. <laughs> Let me look. Yeah, do, I need, do I just need to get rid of the code and make it, maybe I'll just debug it? Or in the actual well, again? it's stuck in a debug mode, and you're going to press the red square to get it to stop. Okay. And then it's back to normal. Okay. So yeah, you're going to need to do the same thing. Once you click break, you're going to click the red button to stop it. Yeah, I didn't get that. Uh, that was unfortunate. So I sometimes you need parentheses like here. If I was going to write this in code, I would not be able to do it this way. Where's notepad? Right, I can't do this. M equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Whoops. Right. <laughs> that is absolutely not correct. What's wrong with it? <laughs> it's that what's works. written there. It won't ever follow orders of operation. You have to do. Right. The order of operation means it's going to do that first. Yeah. So you have to use parentheses to fix that. Like that. So we'll have to do another uh, print code, right? Like so, yeah. I dare you to try point slow form in uh, C. So if we need to create 6b, we call that 6 times b. I love that word times. It's so childish, but it's so useful. And so it's C equivalent is 6 asterisk b. 3, 12, 3 asterisk 12. 4xy, 4 times x times y. When you mix apples with oranges, type conversion. Inside the computer, the bits for an integer and for a floating point number are completely different and they are incompatible. The chip cannot do math with integers and floating points. They have to be converted to the same type. Integers can do math with integers. Floating points can do math with floating points. But we don't want to have to do that. So the C++ compiler fixes it for us. If I have this, double D equals 3, int I equals 4, C out less than, less than, d, asterisk, i, less than, less than, e, and d, l. 
If we told the computer to multiply an int by a double, it would not be able to do it. There's no circuitry inside the chip for doing that. Fortunately, what C++ does is say, okay, I'll give it some code that will convert one of these to the other format so it'll work. Because inside the computer, doubles have to work with doubles, floating points have to work with floats, ints have to work with ints. So what does it do? Does it convert the double to an int? Well, it better not, because what if d was equal to 1.5 and i was equal to 2? 2. 2 times 1.5 is supposed to equal what? 3. Now, if the d got converted to an int, that means it's a whole number, meaning it got rounded down to 1. And then 1 times 2 is just 2, which is not the answer that we wanted. So the higher type, the more precise type, the floating point type does not get converted to an int to do the math. It's the reverse. The int gets turned into a floating point so that it can multiply 1.5 by 2.0 to get 3. So basically you have to change int i to double? I don't have to. The C++ does it for me. Okay. It sets it up when it's compiling the code and making that executable. It inserts so all the code. Double, always use a double. Well, we're always going to use doubles, but we're also going to use ints for whole numbers. And then we let C++ handle the difference. It, we let C++ do the conversions when necessary. So if they're not of the same type, C++ will convert one of the variables to be the type of the other. So there's a hierarchy. Get rid of long double. That doesn't exist. Doubles uh -huh. are better than floats which are better than longs, or long longs, which are better than ints. This is the hierarchy. Doubles cannot be converted to floats without data loss, right? Because a double has more data in it. It can hold a much larger data. It can hold a number to the exponent of 308. Whereas a float can only hold a number with an exponent of up to 38, right? Rather than 308 zeros after it, it can only have 38 zeros after it. I have a question. Just say. Same for a long long. A long long is a double wide int. It's got eight bytes rather than four. So if you try to convert a long long to an int, data loss could occur. Because a long long can hold a number of up to zillions, whereas an int can only hold up to two billion. Yes, sir? So basically, by using the power of tens, the difference between doubles, floats, long longs, and it, only for doubles and floats, to uh, the negative power of ten to the decimal place, uh, depend. They're different on the basis on how many, how far, how wide uh, the tens powers they go. Yeah, and yeah. Long, long. That's the difference to the right. Correct. Right. A float can have about seven digits times ten up to the thirty-four, or thirty-eight, or something like that. A double can have about 15 or 16 digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, times 10 to 308. You can see that these are much larger numbers, right? A 1 followed by 308 zeros is a lot larger than a one followed by 38 zeros. And also much more precise. I know I've talked about rounding errors, where if you had to add 0.33 to 0.33 to 0.33, you would not get one, you'd get 0.99. And if you expected that to be one, because one over three to two decimal places is 0.33, then by the time you got here, there'd be an error, a rounding error, a small one, right? But it would be. You get less of a rounding error if you have seven digits of precision, you get way less of a rounding area error if you get 15 digits of precision. So just like you said, use double. Just use double. Don't even care about floats. They're too prone to rounding errors, right? They only go out to seven decimal places. We want something that goes out to 15 decimal places. Is a, is a double function built in on all the languages? Or, I mean, because I don't, we, we didn't use doubles in Python. You didn't use them in Python because Python's a weird beast. Um, Python does not support the differentiation between floats and doubles. It had a floating point type, but it can hold its floating point type was a double inside. So I guess for Python, you can define how many digits? No, no, Python just assumes everything's a double. Okay. 
Yeah. I lost wow. the cat. But the command name was float. Actually. Exactly. Right. I hope I find the. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Cap. But <laughs> so if if we do this kind of conversion and we get it wrong, we can lose data. What do I mean by that? Say the population of the planet is nine billion or eight billion. I don't know exactly. A billion is a number followed by nine zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then what if for some reason I thought that I could use that calculation, that number, and I wanted to put it inside an int? I already have an int called i. I'm going to make a new one though. Int j is equal to pop. -P. Now when I print out j, it is not going to print out 8 billion. Say data loss. Yeah, well, it doesn't say it. Java wouldn't even let it compile. Java would declare the syntax error and say, yo, you're a loser. You're trying to uh, you know, do something that's unsafe. You've messed up your data. C++ goes ahead and compiles it, but it sh should show a warning. If I click on the warning list, oh, it's saying initializing conversion from that to that. We're trying to take a 64-bit data type and put it in a 32-bit data type and so we got data loss. This number is just too large to store into an int. So put it as long long. Yeah, if I made this one a long long as well, it worked just fine. But what if I made it a double? It Doubles are great, right? Because doubles can hold huge numbers. Doubles can hold numbers with 308 zeros after them, right? Eight to the power of 9, or 8 times 10 to the power of 9, great, no problem. So it's fine to put an int into a double, or a long long into a double, but the other won't work, right? So now that j is a double, if I do this, int k equals j, again, that's a statement that Java would not even compile. It would, it would declare those being unsafe. This will display it as a warning. Oops, I forgot to print out J, I mean K. So let me print out K. I'm going to change this C out from J to K. It'll probably crash. There we go again, right? Now we're really not going to see too many crashes. Divide by zero is the big thing that causes the crash. As long as we're not dividing by zero, we ought to be good to go. But we are suffering data loss, right? It does not equal 9 billion. It equals that. Well, what if we just try to sh store something small into it? Int k is equal to 3.3. .3. That ought to work. But no, because this is a whole number. That's a fractional number. k is only equal to 3. That's all it can have is whole numbers in it because it's declared of type integer. Now, Python would flip on the fly, right? You could store an integer in it, and then you could turn around and put a, a float in it, and then you could turn around and put a string in it, and then you, right, you could do anything with any variable. In these languages, once you declare them, that's the only kind of data they can hold. So safe conversions, where you do not lose data, it's safe to go from a character. In fact, let, let's make our little hierarchy chart. Doubles the king of the hill. Does hold big, bigger data than anything else. And then float, and then long long, and then ints, and then shorts, and then care, or bytes. A care is a byte. It's safe to convert a character to a short, or to an int, or a long long, or a float, or a double. It's safe to convert a short to an int, it's safe to convert a long long to a float. It's safe to convert a float to a double, but it's not safe to go down. And the reason for that is the number of bytes that they occupy and whether they support floating points. A character is one byte. A short is two bytes. An int is a four byte whole number. A long long is an eight byte whole number, much larger. 
a float is a 4-byte floating point number. And a double is an 8-byte floating point number. And we're going to certainly have to spend a lecture talking about bytes and how data is stored in them. We won't talk much about how floating point numbers are stored in bytes because it's a little esoteric. We were talking about powers of 10, 10 to the 308 and stuff like that. But inside it all, it's all zeros and ones. So it's to the powers of 2 rather than to the powers of 10. Good deal. Well, maybe some of us thought about getting coffee or dinner right before we came. So I've said these rules before, or guidelines, they're not rules. Use int unless you know you need something else, and just use double. Right. So your default data type ought to be int unless it needs to be larger than 2 billion. And your default data type for floating points should just be double as a matter of course, because you want those 15 digits of precision rather than seven digits of precision. You want those decimal places in your calculations to reduce rounding errors. So type coercion. This is the only textbook I've seen that I'm teaching with right now that uses the term coercion. You know what coercion means. It means being forced. Your boss coerces you into working overtime, right? Sounds bad, but well, it's not necessarily. All it is is automatic conversion of an operand to another data type. What does that mean? Just like I was telling you, if you have some math going on and the operands are of different types, one will get coerced to be the other type. The int will be coerced to be a double so that the math will work. When data is being coerced, if the compiler can swing it, it's going to go down the hierarchy chart, uh, up the hierarchy chart. It's okay to coerce an int to be a float or a double. It's okay to coerce an int to be a long long. But it's certainly not okay to do the other. So it will try, if it can, if it can get away with it, to coerce from one to the other. So. so that's called promotion. Promotion is a good thing. I like being promoted. So does data. You promote data up to the better data type. You're not going to lose data. No problem. And C++ arranges all that for you. Yes, sir. So if you try and demote, um, your you're going to lose data. Your and your data becomes corrupted, right? Well, it can be. If the number is small, maybe not. Right, like if I use a long long, I'm just going to call it LL, to hold a small number like 6, 5,000, and then I create an int and I put that value in there. When I print it out, no problem. Whoops, why did I put 5,000 there? It's going to print out 50,000, just no problem because this was small. It was, it was less than 2 billion, so no problem. However, if this becomes a large number, five. like 5 trillion, which is 12 zeros, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, obviously that cannot fit into an int. And so it comes up with something garbage. So each each kind of data has a maximum value that it can store. And once the, that ex, is exceeded, it does something called a wraparound, which completely messes things up. But what the wraparound is, is if you have one byte, one byte, which is 8 bits, and you're counting with it, the maximum value you can hold is 255. And if you add one to 255, it resets it back to zero. And a lot of old video games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and stuff like that would crash or something weird would happen if you played it too long, like past 255 levels. Pac-Man level 256.
All righty. This is going to be a real hard level to finish, isn't it? Why did it do that? Because it got up to two, level 255, which is the largest value that a byte can hold. And then it went to level 256. But you can't go to level 256 if there's only a byte. It reset it back to zero, and it tried to draw a level zero. Pac-Man wasn't supported programmed to draw a level zero. It started its levels at one. And so it didn't know what to do, and it just drew this garbage. And so that's as far as you can play Pac-Man. It's 255 levels, and then the game stops. Now, it's very likely that the guy who programmed Pac-Man never expected anybody to get that far, so it didn't matter, right? What kind of crazy lunatic would play Pac-Man for eight hours to get to, you know? But people figured out how to do that, because you know people, if there's a way to play a video game forever, they'll figure out how to do it. But that's called data overflow. We could demonstrate data overflow. Let's use a while loop again, because while loops are awesome, to make data that's too large and causes an overflow. An overflow is when you exceed the maximum value that a data type can hold. I've already said that ints can hold up to about 2 billion. So int value is equal to 1. Ints can hold up to about 2 billion. It's a little larger really, but not much. So if we write a while loop that just keeps multiplying i over and over and over times 2, doubling it, it's going to go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. Eventually it's going to double past 2 billion. So we need some kind of counter so that we can double it, you know, 10 times or 20 times or 30 times or 40 times or whatever. So let's create a counter. I think we already had one called x. But let's, let's create a counter. Let's set it equal to 1. And then while, parentheses, counter is less than or equal to 10, in parentheses, on the next line, Value equals value, asterisk 2, semicolon. Counter, plus, plus, add 1 to the counter. And then let's write out, C out, less than, less than, value. Less than, less than, ENDL. I think you have to write a uh, curly brace, just like in uh, CSS. So when I run it, it's going to go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. Now if you double something 10 times, it gets to 1024. That's not too bad, right? It's not more than 2 billion. What if I double it 20 times? What if I make a counter less than or equal to 20? Right, it doubled a lot more, but it only got to 1 million. No problem. Let's make it 30. We're going to double that 1 30 times and see how large it gets. All righty. It got up to a billion. Looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yep, it got to 1 billion. Well, 30 wasn't, didn't break it. Let's double it 40 times. And there we go. Look at that. When it tried to double 1 billion, 73 million, and so on, it got too large. We had data overflow. It exceeded the amount of data that could be held in four bytes. And so it did some weird kind of wraparound that corrupted <coughs> the data. And past, past that point, all bets are off, right? So the data got too large. If we changed it to a long, excuse me, a long, long, utterly no problem, right? Because the maximum value of a long long is far larger than 2 billion. So if I come up here and I change my int here to a long long and run it, it'll work nice, right? I don't know how long, how large. Yeah, let's keep, let's keep doing that. I'm going to make this like 50 and see if it corrupts. Nope. 60.
Nope. 70. Yeah, yeah. When we tried to double a number 70 times, I don't know how many zeros, you know, I don't know how many quintillions that is, but it got to the point where the data got corrupted. Again, even though we had eight bytes dedicated to holding that numeric value, wasn't enough. If that's the case, you're gonna switch over and start using doubles. If we change long, long to double, it'd be an awfully long time before we saw anything like that. Right, it switched over to scientific notation so it can get very large. And we've already said that a double can go up till, you know, you have 308, exponent to 308. So we could double that a whole bunch of times. I think it was more fun though, when it was a long one. So we could actually see the error happen. Mm -hmm. So, do we have any syntax errors you'd like my eyeballs on? So, nope. All right. I don't know how many quintillions that was. But <laughs> somebody corrupted the data. Yeah. So you're getting a bunch of zeros. So characters and shorts get promoted to ints just fine, right? Because they're smaller. A character is one byte, a short is two bytes, and an int is four bytes. So smaller data types can always go into larger data bytes, no problem. The lower type is promoted to the type of the higher one. If you have this expression, you know, V1 times V2, if they are of different types, then whichever one is the lower data type will be converted to the upper, the higher data type. So if you have an int and a float, the int will get converted to a float. If you have an int and a long, the int gets converted to a long. If you have a long and a double, the long gets converted into a double and not vice versa. Why don't you get rid of the counter? So overflow and underflow, we've been talking about overflow. Overflow is when the data gets too large to hold in that variable. So what's underflow? Well, it just got too small. So overflow happens when data is too large to be held in a variable of that type. And it's so-called wrapped around. What does that mean? Well, let's demonstrate some wrap around. We're gonna hold data, we're gonna be weird and stored in a character because a character is a single byte. We're gonna use another while loop for this purpose. Let's reset counter to one. Counter equals one. Let's create a character to hold our value. So I'm just gonna call it V2. We already have a value. And I'm gonna set it equal to, oh, I don't know, 250. Just because I happen to know that the maximum value of a character is 255. Let's write our while loop again. Or we probably don't even need a while loop we, if we did some cutting and pasting, but why not? While parentheses counter less than 10. It's not going to take long to demonstrate this problem. While counter less than 10, curly brace. Let's see out the value of the character and then add one to it. So see out less than less than int parentheses v2 end parentheses convert that to an int for us okay less than less than e and dl and then add one to the character v2 plus plus and we're going to see it count 250 251 252 253 and so on Ooh, look at that that's not what i expected at all <laughs> it's in an infinite loop can you, get, can you guess why? If you look at this code, if you've done programming before, you can probably guess why it's in an infinite loop. You didn't uh, set your counter right. Yeah, we never incremented counter. Counter plus plus. Fail. 
And there we go. Well, that's not what I expected to see at all. <laughs> oh. It's treating 250 like it was a minus 6, and uh, 251 is over a minus 5. And I don't know how to uh, fix that, so I'm just going to blow this part of the assignment of the demonstration off. Goodbye. Sorry about that. Goodbye. What's happening is is what's known as a sign bit. And we haven't talked about binary and sign bits enough for me to even explain what happened. Tell you what. Let's start. Go back to this code. Undo that deletion if you deleted it. Start v2 off at 1. And change the counter maximum from 10 to like 300. So you saw what I did. I changed this line. I changed the starting value to 1. I changed this line. I set the uh, maximum value for the counter to be less than 300. And then when you run it, you have to scroll way up to see it, where it starts. But right here, it started counting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way. Keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And then when it hits 127, it flips to be minus 128. And then minus 127, 126, 125, and so on. And now it keeps counting up until it gets to zero and starts becoming positive again. And if it ever got past 127 again, it would flip again. And that's what's that's due to what's known as the sign bit. We will talk about the sign bit, so you can just tuck that word away in your brain and it will hit it again. Yes, sir. Uh, can you see it looks like? Yeah, sure. Counter, wait. Wait a minute, why is my counter an error? It, it, okay, so something has happened which I wish had not happened, but when you try to build it, it's going to display that there's an error down here. When you try to run it, it says the project is out of date. Would you like to build it? Yes. There are build errors. Would you like to continue and run the last build? No, if there are build errors, you never want to continue it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put that and we're going to say no. Never run if there's a build error. Just okay. So our jobs, initializing, that's actually just a warning we can ignore. If we ever see end of files found, because we don't have enough closing braces. We have an open brace here, so we need to have a closing brace here. That was easy. Wait a minute, something's off. sure why, but it's getting error saying we, we don't have counter defined, so we may as well just make it int space counter. I don't have int space counter, but that's because you edited your code instead of adding new code to it. So go ahead and just add the word int to it. Okay. Yeah, you'll be good to go. Alright. Oh! And it's an overstrike mode, so it's erasing everything you type. Just click insert and fix it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, if you accidentally press the insert key, then uh, when you start typing, like if I wanted to make this a double, 
it does this horrible thing. <laughs> so you got to hit the insert key again to get it out of that mode. Uh, I thought I did something wrong. I kept doing that like, yeah. what the heck? So typecasting is when you convert data from one format to the other. And so that's like when you convert an int to a float or float to an int. You saw me do that once here when I use the int function to turn that character into an int. When in my <laughs> error list, I have a couple of errors, except they're not errors, they're warnings. Conversion from that to that possible loss of data. That's useful information, right? That's why it's giving me these warnings, telling me, yo, you messed up, or something may go wrong. If I double click on one of these, I can make that error go away, though, by using casting. I could say, I want you to convert to a double, and I'm aware of the risks. That would get rid of the warning. So now when I build it, I'm not gonna have those three warnings. I'll have two warnings. Okay, I'm gonna fix the next one. It's complaining about me converting to an int. It's saying it's unsafe. All right, but what if I really wanted it to do it and I'm sure that it's a good thing? I know better than the computer, so I'm gonna put int there to convert it to an int. This is called casting like casting a piece of metal. You melt the lead and you reform it into something else. This is reforming that long, long to make it a double. This is reforming that 3.3 .3 to make it an int. Then you only get one error. One, and I can cast that one as well. So error list, warning, there it is, right? That's when I was trying to turn five gazillion into an int. If I put that there, it removes the warning. It behaves the same. It just removes the warning. It lets the compiler know that we really did mean for that to happen, that we're not just being dumb, that we meant for it to happen, and we're aware of the risks of data loss, and we're going to go ahead and make it do the conversions anyways. And there we go. Now, each one of those warnings, if we had written this in Java instead, would be considered a syntax error, and it just would not compile. But you would fix it in the same way. Error. Now that's about probably about far enough for us to go. Well, maybe we'll go just a little bit further, but I want to go and find our homework assignment. Our homework assignment is to play Donkey Kong. No way, that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> Let's go really find something. Donkey Kong also has an error like Pac Man where you can only play it up to a certain level and it stops. They fixed that, didn't they? Uh, if you got it for some uh, other system other than the original, like if you downloaded it for your Wii or your Switch or something, yeah, it probably works fine. <laughs> that one's going to take too long to explain. Wait a minute. I'm Conversions using modules. Too. This is a different homework. Too. I have old homework assignments from last semester tucked in here so I can reuse them. But we're not going to do that one. So let's look at the next one, interest calculator. I need to change that to homework three. So I'm sure you all know what the idea of compound interest is. Compound interest is like your credit card it has an interest rate of 24%, so if you don't pay it off fast, it's going to build up faster and faster, right? Or you have some kind of IRA you know, account or something at a bank, and it's going to earn 10% interest a year. Uh, good luck finding that, but that'd be nice, right? And so your money's going to grow by 10% each year. There's a formula for that. So here is the formula to calculate compound interest. We need to explain what the variables are. And I'd recommend going ahead and looking at this because you're going to be working on it. A is the final amount. 
P is the principal, the starting amount. You have $1,000 on your credit card, then P would be 1000 R stands for the interest rate. 10% is dot one, 20% is dot two, 33% is dot three three. N is the number of times a year that the interest is calculated. We just want 12 times a year. That's how interest is calculated in, according to our banks and credit cards and stuff like that. And then T stands for time. So you're going to write a compound NT. interest calculator. Wait a minute. Is that NT at the, after the parentheses? Yep. So P stands for initial deposit. R is an interest rate expressed as a fraction, like 0 .6. 0 0.06 means 6%. T is the number of years. And we're going to assume that N is 12. 12 times a year, monthly. So we're going to ask the user for those values. What is the initial deposit? OK, I hear this is funny. I say use good English, and then I misspell that word. I'm proud of myself. Anyways, so don't just say, what is P? Instead, ask them what is the initial deposit. Don't just say R equals. Ask them for the initial rate, and then display the final amount. So you should test your code by doing these values. If you deposit a 1000 bucks in, with 5% interest for 10 years, your end result's going to be about $1,647. See if that if your program that gets close to that. So here's the real trick, right? Taking something to the power of. How do you take something to the power of? We've already mentioned it once or twice. POW. Yep, POW. So you're going to have to rewrite this equation using POW. Make all your data type doubles, not ints, to avoid any uh, strange conversion errors. So does that make sense? Your program's just going to ask the user for the principal, and then for the interest rate, and then the number of years, and it's going to perform a calculation so it can display the final amount. Is that good enough? Are we comfortable with that? If you work on it over the weekend and it doesn't make sense, if you get stuck, then we'll talk about that on Tuesday and maybe we'll extend it by a few days. But do work on it over the weekend. Don't wait until Tuesday and say, I didn't work on it and expect you get to get extended. Like right. This is also due on the 9th as well? Uh, It'll be due um, a week from today, okay. now let's the 11th. But like I said, if, if uh, we get to the 10th and it's blown people's minds, then yeah, we'll extend it to all over the weekend. But try to get it done. Is that homework? Yep, that's the homework, and I'll make a Dropbox for it and all that. Wow. Can you make the Dropbox for the lecture? I'm going to do that right now.